can AI democratize health for the next billion? I want to bring us back there. Yeah, and, and just reflecting on, on the conversation here, I, I, a lot of how, at least I've thought about building Whoop, is very uh, customer first or like, you know, individual first. And it strikes me that we've talked a lot about, you know, different regulations and, you know, what doctor's offices are going to do. And we've almost looked at it more from the bureaucracy standpoint. But I think that when you talk about a billion people, it's going to come from the users first. And, you know, we might be able to learn something from the education system right now. So it wasn't like generative AI went to the education system and said, hey, we're interested in rolling out, you know, large language models. We're interested in, you know, helping the students better understand how to write papers and answer questions. It was just like all of a sudden every school around the world woke up to the fact that their students can now write a paper entirely from a large language model. And now every school is trying to figure out what the hell do we do with this new world? <laughs> and they're changing way faster than they ever thought they would. And I think what we're going to see happen in healthcare is that level of disruption, where all of a sudden answers are going to be at the fingertips of individuals around the world. Um, you know, there'll be someone wearing a whoop and the AI layer that sits on top of that is going to tell them they're about to have a heart attack in 30 minutes. And guess what? They're not going to call their doctor and ask. They're just going to go to the ER, right? And all of a sudden, when these things start to happen in real time, the system is going to have to adapt rapidly. And I think what's so powerful about AI, as you talk about a billion people, is that the cost of that level of intelligence is going to be so low yeah. that it's going to be touching every individual. And so that's what's going to push the system over. Amir, going to you next. Yeah, I think we can have a doctor in everybody's pocket. Exactly. And I think actually technology-wise, that's here today. At least kind of a triage and diagnostic. I don't a, do think, a doctor or a much better doctor in everybody's well, pocket? Well, I still believe we need humanity and compassion and also... Do you not think that AI can be more empathic than a human? I, I, I think for, <laughs> that most humans probably, possibly. I do think... I think um, the, the data does show that, right? I, I think that's right. And there's good, good data on that. But I, I think the key here is today there's a lot of barriers to access information. And even if you have great insurance or great resources, uh, even if your name's on the side of a building, I just visited somebody at, uh, at Harvard whose name's on the side of the building. I said, how long does it take you to get an appointment? He said, well, I saw a nurse practitioner in 10 days <laughs> and his name's on, a, on one of the buildings. So, you know, everybody wants that immediate access and service. And so those initial questions, I think we could have assessed. And I think to Will's good point, I was just vi visiting with the Red Crescent team, the ambulance EMS services here, and they've now got kind of remote telemetry. You can measure EEG in the fields or so you can get uh, stroke protocol going or door to balloon time faster. But if it was on your whoop, yeah. I could get that even faster. So that's, I think all very doable. The integration into the existing ecosystem is where it'll fall. But I, I agree with what Will said. If we could put it in the hands of consumers of people, they'll have that information. Um, and I think the technology is here and it's available. And so I'm, I'm very excited about that. Wonderful, well, Dr. Tannenbaum. So um, yeah, I, mean, I agree with the line that everybody's going down. A doctor, doctor in a pocket concept is, is already here and now. And, and uh, but the problem is, uh, it's hard to get a person to trust uh, an AI to deliver their care. You know, the, the whole doctor... Do you think that's generational? <clears throat> um, over time, it will be. However, um, I, I was going to a slightly different place, which is that uh, I think that the place where places where it will likely get adopted more readily is where the doctors are accepting of the AI um, with the patient. And I think there's economic alignment uh, in places that are capitated, where you know, for example, you have six months of waiting, and you can effectively make a much more streamlined system because now it's augmented uh, effectively, but still doctors in the loop. Do you think, Jim, that uh, uh, physicians will spend a quarter million or a half a million dollars going through medical school? if they're playing second fiddle to an AI that a nurse practitioner could easily 
Well, I don't think there's any. I don't think there's any decrease in uh, in uh, uh, acceptance. Uh, you know, rates at uh, you know high uh, top uh, various medical schools. It's still impossible to get into medical school. So there's a, a, a great deal of interest in. It. And I think the role of a physician, and this is actually something I've been interested in philanthropically. Uh, you know, is going to change uh, and evolve. It has so what, to. What's your vision? Um, my vision is more of a uh, business a businessman. Uh, woman, you know, sort of um, uh, objective, what's the best, you know, sort of uh, processes for me to um, adopt in order to be able to deliver measurably the best care, the least expensively. So and, more of a health coach and, uh, or a consultant? Um, could be, could be, although the AI could power up the doctor too. I mean, yeah. you're talking about the last mile, yeah. you know, and the last mile could come in a bunch of different ways. I mean, it could be on your cell phone if that's the way you like the last mile. It could be delivered to you by a nurse practitioner, you know, as well, if you want the human interaction. But I, I think that in general, um, physicians that, that adopt these tools are going to be advantaged and they're going to be advantaged in uh, various systems better than others. But I think capitation is you know, kind of one place where, you know, they, there's a fixed pot. They can do something more efficient. They can share more in that pot. Dr. Oz, take us home, please, <clears throat> on, on the topic. I think you... <laughs> You teach people how to treat you. That's true in our personal lives. It's going to be true in the medical care system. It has not historically been the case because there was a asymmetric advantage to physicians because they had domain expertise. The word doctor don't mean doctor or teacher. We're supposed to be teachers, not orderers. And I do think the economics of medicine have always been driven to making more money for the people who are providing the care. But the people who deserve more value, who will ultimately use AI to drive it for the extra billion entering the system, are the employers, the governments, the people who need the productivity of people. Just being very pragmatic about this. If I'm running a business and my employees are present, presenteeism, they're there, but they're not really at full speed, or they're not there because of various health ailments, that's a problem. It's why we focus so hard in the US on employee and occupational health. That's why we're working with the National Council of Occupational Health here with this big program. It's mission critical for the Saudis to have a workforce that is healthy because they don't have enough people to do the work. And it's gonna be that way, I think, for the billion people as they come into the system, they're gonna to wanna to have jobs and stay in those jobs and earn money and build wealth for themselves and have a confidence for the future and therefore consume. It runs the whole cycle. We've never thought of healthcare as that. Healthcare is always seen as a drain on the economy. Right, $4 trillion coming out of the economy, as opposed to generating a lot of value for the nations that have high quality health care. So keeping clean water, avoiding communicable diseases, making sure that you've got folks that are able to get basic preventive care so they all can live with a health span that that's you know, the way they want to live until they're at least 85 is something that's valuable. But I do have aspirations that will go even higher than that. I think 120, which you've mentioned, maybe longer. <laughs> but that, think of how much value there is to someone who's 75 years old, who's learned all that, who can offer back because they've been kept healthy. The only way to keep the system honest is a smarter arbitrar. And AI is the only thing in my lifetime that's been close to doing that. So it's going to allow all these transformations to happen. And without AI, and there's a lot of arguments about the good or the bad, AI is not going to be the problem. It's people who use AI who aren't good.